Can everyone hear me? Okay. Perfect timing. All right, everyone. Um, sorry for the slightly delayed start, but thank you so much for joining me to talk about this important and um, interesting subject. The title of this lightning talk is It's Not All Doom and Gloom. The Future of Democracy and Markets Can Be Positive. My name is Ritika Singh. I'll be presenting uh, the results of a survey that my organization and several others conducted. Um, I'm from the Center for International Private Enterprise, or SIP. For those of you who don't know, SIP is based in Washington, D.C., and is a business-oriented NGO that works at the intersection of democracy and economic development. And SIPE's mission is to strengthen democracy through private sector and market-oriented reform. Um, SIPE is one of the four core institutes of the National Endowment for Democracy, the NED, and an affiliate of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. So with that, let's get right into it. Um, I wanted to start with this quote. Um, the we can dive right in um, with this one. Um, it's one of my favorite quotes by one of my favorite authors. Um, it goes, most future fictions are boring. It's always dark and always raining, and people are so unhappy. I, uh, as I said, I happen to love this author, um, but this pessimism in this quote is exactly what we are trying to counter in this project and what I'll talk about throughout the course of this presentation. So let me just take a step back and start by talking about the narratives of the future of technology and the future of democracy that you all are probably very familiar with. So these narratives tend to fall into two tropes, right? One is digital authoritarianism and the other is the surveillance economy. So we're all aware for the most part of the malign use of technology by authoritarian regimes such as China and Russia and how they contribute to democratic backsliding globally. So the concerns around a lot of the uh, malign use of technology by these regimes are very large and um, have been studied and talked about for many, many years. And they range from AI-powered surveillance to large-scale censorship, dissemination of disinformation in systematic ways. But the surveillance economy model, which is the only other real alternative that we know is concerning as well. It's, uh, you know, it centers around the commercialization of personal data by big tech. There's concerns about lack of security. There's con also concerns about misinformation. So put simply, we just don't really have an internet that is based on our democratic values and norms of openness, accountability, and respect for human rights. Neither of these two models really fits the bill. So this project is our attempt at countering these two narratives of doom and gloom, hence the title, and seeking to provide an alternate positive vision for democracy. We want to really try and articulate and advance uh, a technology-empowered democratic future. So here's what we did in order to, uh, to try and articulate this democratic future. We decided to conduct a survey of SIP, my organization, NDI, the National Democratic Institute, IRI, the International Republican Institute, and NED, the National Endowment for Democracy's global partners and other democratic reformers. We selected survey provider Ipsos to conduct this survey, and we're unveiling the results for the first time here at IGF. Um, what this survey means for you. So we hope that it will do two things after we go through the results here together. One, we want to inform you, so we want to broaden the understanding of what a positive future of democracy could look like in the digital age, and we want to inspire you. We want you to use these insights to think about different tangible actions that you could take locally, think about um, different ideas that you get from the results that provide fodder for your work and allow us as an internet governance community, as a democracy community, to move forward. So jumping right into the survey, um, we were able to survey 518 democratic reformers all around the world from 97 countries. As I said, they were part of our NED network. 
the survey was conducted from May to June 2022, and we did the survey in six languages to ensure that we got participation from a wide variety of stakeholders in all of these regions. Um, the, some more information about the methodology is here on this slide. Um, who were the respondents? So before we jump into the results, let's talk about who we asked these questions of. Um, as I said, 518 people, oh, sorry. Yep, as I said, 518 people um, from all these regions. Um, and you can see the surveys that we conducted here. Um, the age and gender of the respondents. So the average age of the respondents was 38.3 years old, but as you can see, most of the respondents were between 25 and 59. Um, in terms of gender, we got a sort of even split, 55% men, 41% women. And then in terms of what type of organization the respondents affiliated with, unsurprisingly, most of them 60% almost said that they worked for an NGO or a civil society organization, but we did have representation from folks at think tanks, business associations, and others. And lastly, just to get a sense of who we were asking these questions of, we asked all the respondents to describe the political, economic, and social freedoms in the country they live in. How do they self-identify with the government regime in their country. So we asked respondents to rate the countries on a, a scale of one to five, one meaning very closed or authoritarian societies, and five meaning very free or democratic societies. The average respondent was a 2.8, so not actually very democratic, like more towards the authoritarian uh, end of the scale. And um, just for additional understanding of the respondents, we broke down these responses by region. And you know, unsurprisingly, logically, the largest gap is between Europe and Africa and the Middle East. So 44% of respondents from Europe described their political system as democratic. And 51% of respondents from Africa and 50% of respondents from Asia qualified their countries as authoritarian. So that was probably the biggest disparity that we got. Um, let's jump in now to the survey results. So the first indication that it's not all doom and gloom is the data that we got in response to the question, how would you rate the influence of the internet on democracy and rights in your country? 44% said that it had a positive influence and 42% said that it had an equal positive and negative influence, with only 14% saying it had a negative influence. So great news for all of us here at IGF, right? Like the internet is still seen as a positive force for democracy, despite all the issues that it comes with, and despite all the issues that we are discussing at this conference. Let's drill down a little bit by region. So respondents from Africa and the Asia Pacific were the most enthusiastic about the influence of the internet on democracy and rights. Likely because these are the regions that have experienced some of the most authoritarian governments and the internet may have helped reformers and activists in Africa and the Asia Pacific counter democratic backsliding. Next, we asked respondents uh, for a, another data point and this also shows us that it's not all doom and gloom, although a bit more tempered, frankly, because in response to our question, which type of government has benefited more from the internet and digital technologies, most respondents say both democratic and authoritarian governments have benefited equally, followed by 28% who think democratic governments have benefited more than authoritarian governments, probably because technology allows access to information, freedom of expression, political participation, reasons like these were identified. And 18%, so the smallest number, were respondents who think that authoritarian governments have benefited more than democratic governments. A quick snapshot, um, I just wanna draw your attention to one outlier here. It's highlighted in orange. 
34% of respondents from South America think that authoritarian governments have benefited from the internet and digital technologies more than democratic governments, which is much higher than the global average of 18%. We also asked respondents, what are the most important ways in which technology can be used as a force for good? None of these answers should come as a surprise. Um, it should be pretty reassuring given most of your areas of programming, but we have access to information, accountability, transparency, participation, tackling corruption, these types of themes. And moving on, uh, when it comes to the intersection of democracy and technology, 63%, so by a large margin, respondents are most worried about disinformation and misinformation. Probably not surprisingly, given all the things that we've seen in the world over the last couple of years, but other worries include online harassment and hate speech at 51%, big, misuse of big data, comes after that at 31% and surveillance at 30%. Somewhat surprisingly, we thought the future of work and jobs was ranked last because this tends to generate a lot of hysteria in politics um, and by politicians, but it ranked last as a concern when it comes to the intersection of democracy and technology in the future. So just quickly drilling down by region as well, since um, that might help inform your work, European respondents are most worried about disinformation and misinformation. So this is a clear area of opportunity for our programming for the foreseeable future, likely. And respondents from the Middle East are most concerned with hate speech and on online harassment. Um, when we think about why, it's probably likely because of the absent or improper regulation of technology, which again, I've highlighted these data points that I'm talking about in orange, but we can see that respondents from the Middle East are most concerned with the absent or improper regulation of technology um, compared to other regions. So you can see that in the last row. And speaking of this exact subject, South American respondents are not very concerned about it compared to the rest of the world. But interestingly, they, they are concerned about misuse of big data. So we see some interesting dichotomies here. Um, perhaps South American respondents are concerned about misuse of big data, but they just don't think regulation is the best way to address it. I mean, that, that could explain the, the disparity here. Next, we asked respondents, OK, looking into the future, what are the key principles and values that should underpin the future of democracy in the digital age? And again, their top responses will not surprise you. Um, it should validate a lot of the topics that most of you probably work on, but freedom of expression, privacy, and transparency were the top three. And I'll give you a moment to just see what some of the other principles and values were on this list. Drilling down by region, we notice that respondents in Europe and North America tend to value freedom of expression less than elsewhere. So only 42% of um, respondents in Europe and 44% in North America think freedom of expression should underpin a democratic future. But the score reaches 65% in the Middle East, 62% in Africa, 57% in the Asia Pacific. But Interestingly, again, we see a dichotomy here, like those same respondents that don't really think freedom of expression is that important for the future, they are concerned by privacy and data protection. So more so than people from other countries. Here, we asked respondents which application of technology would be most beneficial for democracy in the future. 65% of respondents said encryption. That is the third uh, graph, uh, the third line of the, the, the chart that you see. So this is one of the biggest tools that democratic reformers use to operate, right? 
But we know that in most cases, encryption is really challenging because corporations create and control encrypted technologies, and governments are often advocating for exemptions. So if there's one thing to fight to protect, respondents argue that it should be encryption and encrypted communications. And this doesn't just mean messaging apps, by the way. We asked specifically about different types of encryption. It means developing secure platforms for online voting and other such activities where encryption is necessary. So here, um, I just wanted to show you all that we can see a great deal of agreement across the globe on these applications of technology to advance democracy. Besides encrypted communications, respondents want uh, an enabling digital environment for protected political mobilization and participation, and they want to leverage technology to crowdsource ideas as well. Those were some of the other top responses that came in. When we asked respondents what would be most helpful to bridge the gap between technological innovation and people's understanding of technology or tech regulations, there's a wide consensus on the importance of education. So you can see in like the top couple of responses, different types of education were highly valued, whether it's reskilling or retraining for workers, teaching technology in schools, teaching to, to policymakers, but note the outlier at the bottom. Right? Respondents don't think that it would be particularly helpful to have stakeholder consultations and public-private dialogues to provide input on global norms and standards. That's kind of surprising. Let's try and take a look at which respondents are saying this. When we look at it by region, we can see that respondents in North America and Europe are the ones that find it the least useful to have stakeholder consultations. And this is a finding that is kind of interesting but also troubling because it's quite common in Europe and in North America. There's many well-established mechanisms. These are highly digitalized societies where people have channels and business associations have channels and citizens have different avenues to comment on tech regulations should they wish to. So we should ask ourselves, what isn't working for people? We're giving people the opportunity to comment on tech regulations, but clearly giving them an opportunity to participate is not enough. And we just thought that this was a very interesting finding that could help inform the way that we think about programming in the future, priorities in our organizations in the future. Clearly, this survey shows that education is much more helpful than stakeholder consultations. Another question that we asked that yielded similar responses to the previous one that I just talked about is what are effective ways to shape global norms and standards that strengthen trust in future applications of technology? So we gave respondents all of these choices and again we see that education, digital education training for citizens and decision makers came in first at 59%. And again, we see that engagement at the international level isn't necessarily something that citizens value. So it's only 39%. That's the fourth row down. Um, at a recent OECD public governance ministerial meeting, actually, on building trust and reinforcing democracy, we learned that when citizens keep providing feedback, and providing input as stakeholders, but it doesn't get incorporated, naturally it erodes trust in global norms and standards, right? And so we are obviously all at this conference, and it's a conference that's heavily focused on shaping global norms and standards and technology, but this data tells us that it's not enough, and it isn't necessarily the most valuable way to strengthen trust. This slide is very telling. I just wanted to draw your all's attention to it because in previous questions, we saw high levels of consensus with the numbers at like 90% across the board. But the biggest takeaway from this particular data is that there is no consensus on how to strengthen trust around the world. So if there's one call to action from this data, let's take this as a call to action. There's no consensus on how to strengthen trust and it's our job to find out how to improve that. 
Um, I'm winding up here. What I want to do is um, leave you, attempt to leave you with some solutions. And for that, I'll turn it over to my colleague Sarah Moulton from NDI in a moment. But we asked respondents in our survey what organizations or individuals give you hope for a future of democracy that is improved through technology? And how have they used technology to positively enable democracy? Why do they inspire you? A lot of respondents pointed to tools that NDI has developed over the years, and um, they uh, said that these tools that NDI has provided inspire them for a positive future of democracy enabled by technology. So let me ask Sarah to come up here and um, talk a little bit about some of these tools that you might find helpful in your work. Hi everyone, I'll keep it brief. I know we're almost at time, but I did just want to talk a little bit about um, what we at National Democratic Institute, how we have kind of perceived this over the years and how important for us transparency is in working with governments and citizens, lawmakers to really increase the uh, uh, transparency of interactions between them, of government services, and how do we uh, help encourage that. And one of our key uh, kind of initiatives has been something called Dem Tools, which unfortunately I do not have a website up, but it's dem.tools, so it's easy to find. Um, but on that website, um, we not only um, kind of curate a list of tools that citizens, governments, anyone who's interested in kind of strengthening the democratic process can potentially use uh, in their own work, whether that's uh, data collection or visualization, um, kind of engagement with through apps, uh, with governments. Uh, you know, we try to do, you know, list a lot of partners, but we also have our own uh, variations that we uh, use, including one uh, for a content management system, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> customer relationship manager uh, called Civi, which we use with different governments um, and political parties, uh, civil society organizations to help them uh, manage their contacts uh, free of charge. Because one of the biggest problems we found, and this also comes up, you know, is with the transparency initiative, is the, the cost. It's very hard. A lot of governments do, are not transparent with their um, initiatives, how they spend their money, um, how they make decisions, and so we're really trying to um, encourage that process and make it as simple as possible to do that. And this kind of looking in the future, really the area that we want to look at is the digital uh, public goods. And we're starting to see more of this uh, type of uh, work being integrated uh, in within governments. Uh, this is part of, you know, contributes to the uh, sustainable development goals, but really c opening the transparency um, of government processes, whether that's through open source software, um, improving imp interoperability of different programs, um, you know, having open data and having different open models and standards for how they do work. And so that may be developing open source software, um, trying to create a culture of sustainability around that, um, but also, you know, it cr encourages collaboration across governments. It helps uh, take away the proprietary software or systems that um, individuals are used to doing, and bless you, uh, it takes the costs uh, for doing that. So encourages local ownership, uh, it fosters innovation. So these are the, this is an area that we're really trying to promote in the work that we're doing is how can we better collaborate with governments, with civil society, lawmakers, to uh, put these systems into place, to be transparent and to encourage uh, this innovation and collaboration. So I know we're at time. I just, I would encourage you, uh, take a look at our website, dem.tools. Um, like if you have any suggestions for tools that um, you have used or that you think are really useful for others to be aware of in terms of promoting that type of collaboration, this is something we encourage everyone to put submissions in for us. Uh, we'd like to write about them. We'd like to share them to the broader audience, but we're always learning as well. So um, anyway, we're hoping that that contributes to this kind of optimistic, trans, you know, this transparency, increased transparency, and a positive vision uh, that comes out of this uh, survey. So thanks, Ritika. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, that's all I have. And I'd love to take any questions, if anyone has any online or from the audience. 
but otherwise we'll be around. Um, so feel free to um, come and talk with us and we can tell you a lot more <laughs> about the survey and about different civic and democratic tools that NDI, SIPE, and IRI have developed over the years. Thank you.